Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for the, uh, to the Caribbean Students Association at the University of the District of Columbia and the American University of Caribbean Circle for organizing this and to Paul who dragged me here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Clarence, who's not here, for the nice introduction about the history of neoliberalism, Chris. Uh, that, you know, I was just asked to give eight minutes on uh, something in the Caribbean. And uh, so I prepared uh, a little bit on Jamaica, which is one of the island groups that I actually haven't written about. Um, and uh, if you want more, by the way, of any of this, uh, you can go to our website at cepr.net. And you can also find, you know, we've had a number of debates with the IMF. IMF changed its policy in the last couple of years. They now debate us. Uh, they didn't for about 10 years. And you can see one that is, uh, and that is a significant change in the IMF. Um, you can see one that was about an hour and a half between me and the head of their world economy division, whose name escapes me now. Maybe Theresa knows it. I can't remember. Is that the world uh, and so, uh, and that was a very good debate. We went through the whole world of IMF agreements, uh, pretty much in about an hour and a half, with a lot of questions and answers. And so we won't have time for that now. Uh, and I want to, I guess, uh, in order so that my colleague Teresa is not implicated here, I want to say from the outset, the IMF is controlled primarily by the U.S. Treasury Department with some input from other rich countries. <laughs> and therefore, the people that work at the IMF are not necessarily responsible for their policy. <laughs> and you can see that, uh, you can see that in the debates that I have had with IMF economists where they very often uh, agree with me and uh, do not agree uh, with or do not defend uh, official policy. And uh, and I can't blame them. Uh, it's not always defensible. And let me give you one example. I'll start with Jamaica, and then we'll go from the specific to the general. Uh, Jamaica is a good example of a country where the IMF is part of, is making two of the big mistakes that it's made throughout the world for uh, decades. And it has not uh, sufficiently corrected. And, you know, uh, Theresa went through all those acronyms about the IMF. You know, Krugman wouldn't say that uh, macroeconomic flexibility for Europe, I can guarantee you that, for the IMF policies in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, uh, or any of the peripheral European countries that are, are now uh, under either IMF policies or policies that are formulated between the IMF and the European Commission uh, and the European Central Bank. So he wouldn't say that. And my memory, when I think of IMF, I think of a a sign that became famous during the 1998 crisis in Asia, where workers in Korea held up a big sign that said, IMF means I'm fired. <laughs> and that was when, in fact, the IMF first became a household word. Prior, prior to the Asian financial crisis, which some of you may remember, there had been protests, riots, demonstrations, in scores of countries against IMF policies, and it really barely made the press here. But it was the first time, that was the first time where the IMF really came under scrutiny and actually was subject uh, to a congressional commission, which, uh, which uh, was called the Meltzer Commission, because that was fa that, that's where their policy, which had a devastating effect on Asia and caused those middle income countries in Asia never to go back to the IMF again. That's why they piled up hundreds of billions of dollars in reserve, uh, so they would never have to borrow from the IMF again. And that was when, you know, Joe Stiglitz, uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner, and uh, full disclosure, also a member of our advisory board at CEPR, uh, uh, resigned, was, was forced out of the World Bank because he criticized the IMF for doing exactly the policies that I'm going to talk about. What are those policies? One is implementing pro-cyclical, what economists call pro-cyclical policy. That means policies that make a recession worse or a weak economy worse. That means cutting spending or raising taxes during a recession. Okay? If you notice, we didn't do that in the United States. What did we do since the recession? We did the opposite. We ran huge deficits, we lowered interest rates to zero, and uh, 
we actually monetize part of the debt. That is, the Fed, Federal Reserve uh, created literally uh, uh, more than a trillion dollars of, of money and used it to, uh, to finance uh, our deficit and our debt. And so that is something that the IMF doesn't allow in the peripheral countries, and now not even in the peripheral countries of Europe. They're now being treated like third world countries. Now, what did they do in Jamaica? In Jamaica, in 2010, they're going to run, uh, they're actually uh, under an IMF agreement, they're cutting, uh, they're tightening, they're engaging in fiscal tightening of 1.9% of GDP. In other words, the opposite of what we're doing here, causing the economy uh, to, it will have the effect of causing the economy to shrink further. They also raised interest rates in the, uh, from September of 2008 to February 2009, they raised interest rates uh, from 6.8 to 21.5 percent, okay? That is also pro-cyclical. Imagine if we do that here, that would be the end of Obama. He wouldn't even make it through his first term, okay? Those two things are called pro-cyclical policies. Now, again, the IMF would come back and they'd say, well, they have no choice. It's not like the United States. They don't have a hard currency dollar that the whole world depends on. But this is not true. There are always alternatives, okay? Jamaica could let their currency fall further, for example, which would give the economy a boost by reducing, uh, by increasing their uh, exports and, and reducing their import. If they can't let it fall too far, if there's a run on the currency, they could use capital controls. Uh, there are always alternatives. That's the thing you always have to remember. The same is true on the debt. Let's take a look at what the IMF was involved in in debt. In January of this year, they had a restructuring of the debt of Jamaica, which was a, one of the highest in the world at 140% of GDP and, and in the developing world. And I want to say that, you know, for those who haven't looked at the you know, arithmetic of debts, 140% of GDP is very high, but it's, it's much worse for Jamaica than it is for Greece or for Spain, or any other countries, or, uh, I mean, Greece has a debt of about that, um, or it will be in about a year or two. Japan has a much higher debt, but the key thing is what the, what's the interest you're paying on it, okay? Jamaica is paying sky high interest rates on their debt. They were paying last year 17% uh, uh, of GDP for their debt service. Now, you have any idea what that I mean, That's like, you know, that's like all of our revenue in the United States, you know. That's like, uh, you know, we pay about maybe 2%. People complain about the debt in the United States. Our debt services is less than 2% of GDP. And so this is a huge debt payment. Now, they restructured it. What do they get the debt down to? 11% of GDP. Well, that's nice. I mean, you could claim that as a serious reduction. But that's still completely uh, unconscionable. For, uh, for any country to have to pay. They're not going to be able to finance anything else, you know, practically anything else in their budget uh, because of that. But the worst part is they didn't reduce the principle of the debt. So in the next one to five years, the, the, the country's going to have to pay off or roll over half of their total debt, half of that 140% of GDP. Now, if there's any kind of another crisis, if borrowing costs go up, they're completely screwed, okay? So they didn't give the creditors a haircut, okay? That's the problem. And that is a historic problem for the IMF. They did the same thing in Argentina. For four years, they squeezed that country, tried to make them pay an unpayable debt, put them through the worst recession, this was 1998 to 2002, that they ever experienced, uh, loss of output comparable to our Great Depression. And what happened? You know, it fell apart, you know, it all collapsed anyway at the end of 2002. Uh, one and the beginning of 2002, and they uh, they defaulted on their debt, the biggest debt default in, in in sovereign debt default in history. And what happened? The economy shrunk for three months, and then they grew 63 percent over the next six years, pulled 11 million people out of poverty, and really it was the best thing they ever could have done. Now, I'm not going to stand here and advise the Jamaican government to default, but that has to be an option. If the IMF and the creditors are not giving you a chance to restore economic growth, then you have to have other alternatives. There's, it's definitional. If the alternative they're offering you is not to reclaim your uh, per capita GDP of 2007 until 2014, 
which is their projections, okay, then there are always better alternatives than that. Better to take the hit and, and then move on with a clean slate. That's the dilemma that Ireland and Spain and these other countries, and especially Greece is facing. Why go through another five years of hell, okay, raising bus fares by 40%, that was part of the agreement, hits poor people, uh, go through all of this uh, pain, and by the way, uh, to, take, to, to take the longer view, okay, this is an economy that's barely grown at all for 20 years. From 1989 uh, so to 2000. This is an economy that has a growth. This is an economy that was under IMF agreements from 1973 to 1996. Okay? And did they produce an economy that could grow at the end of all of that? And by the way, they contributed to the overthrow of the government in, in 1980. That's apparently the Social Democratic government of Michael Manley. That's well documented, just like what Clarence mentioned at the beginning the IMF's contribution to the overthrow of uh, the government of Chile in, in 1973. And so after all this, here they are. The economy is still not growing now. It hasn't been growing. It went into decline in 2007. And they're still squeezing them, still trying to make them pay a debt that is unpayable, still imposing pro uh, policies that we would never accept in the United States, that no country really that had any say or the people had any say in its economic policy. We have admittedly a very limited amount here in the United States, but we still have elections, okay? And we don't have the IMF telling us what to do. That's, you know, one major difference here, okay? As bad as the authorities can be here and in Europe, you know, they still don't have to listen to the IMF. And I know it's voluntary. Somebody mentioned that. Why do they keep coming back? Well, that's, that's a, you know, that's a fair question. I mean, obviously, if you have a government that's tough enough, like Argentina was, they'll tell them to get lost and they'll do a lot better. But a lot of governments aren't that tough. They have to get, they're looking to the next election. The IMF comes in, offers this uh, aid, puts the pain a, a couple of years down the road, allows them to maintain an unsustainable debt burden for another couple of years. And then, uh, so that's what happens. So, uh, have I used up my eight minutes yet with this rant? <laughs> Uh, somebody's going to have to cut me off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another thing. See, so you see the problem here? The IMF, and again, I want to emphasize it's the people who run the IMF, not our esteemed colleague. Uh, the trouble is, uh, they're looking out for the creditors way too much in this circumstance, okay? And they will tell you, well, if a country defaults, they're going to suffer, you know? And there's some truth to that. There's always a cost to a default. But the question is, what is the trade-off, okay? We're all economists. What is the trade-off? Is the trade-off another 10 years of stagnation? And then you call your, you have an unsustainable debt burden anyway, like Greece is going to have, you know, that everybody knows that Greece is going to restructure. Why not do it now instead of, you know, laying off thousands of workers and having, you know, unemployment rate double or triple and everything else they're going through. This is what we're talking about. And why do they do it? Because they're looking out too much for the creditors. In fact, 34% of GDP of this debt is due to the bailing out of the financial sector. And I like that Teresa mentioned as one of the things that the IMF is fighting for, or is in favor of is financial sector regulation. But if you go back to 1991, when they uh, signed their agreement with the IMF, uh, that it was financial deregulation was the trend back then. So maybe the IMF is learning from its mistakes. That would be a good thing. Now, Teresa also mentioned fiscal consolidation for recovery. Well, again, we don't do that here, okay? There are people who want to do that here. They're called Republicans, okay? <laughs> That's why they don't have the presidency or the Senate. And they're gonna lose the House if they actually succeed in doing what they want to do, like they're doing in Jamaica, that is tightening the budget at a time when the economy is weak, and in our case, unemployment is over 9%. At least our economy is growing. Jamaica doesn't even have a growing economy. So that's, I have to say, I think is wrong, okay? Uh, fiscal consolidation, well, do that when you're growing at a healthy pace, all right? That's time for some fiscal consolidation if you actually 
need to do it. Now, as for increasing productivity levels, uh, productivity levels depend on investment, and that includes public investment. Okay, public investment, of course, has been drastically reduced in, in Jamaica in, in, in recent years, and will suffer continual reductions under uh, the IMF program. And I don't expect private investment to come rushing in to an economy that is shrinking. All this stuff about business friendly, okay, yeah. Investors care about friendliness, you know, we're all social people. We're social beings. But what they really care about is profit. And there's very little profit to be made in a shrinking economy, okay? The Chinese don't have business friendly policies and they haven't had them for 30 years. But they're the fastest growing in the economy in the world for the last 30 years. And it's because there were profitable investment opportunities there. So I'm all for private sector playing its role, but we're not going to get there just by giving them whatever they want, okay? And I don't even think they would want, if they had a choice, a program like the IMF is imposing in Jamaica. So I'm going to end it there. I want to say that in question and answer, if you want to ask about other things, Paul mentioned, uh, you know, the country that we're working on the most uh, for months now is Haiti. And uh, there's a historic event taking place as we speak right now, and that is President Aristide, who was overthrown seven years ago by the United States government uh, openly at that time. That is, they openly organized a coup against uh, the government for four years, cutting off all international aid to the country until the government was overthrown. Uh, and he's coming back. Uh, and if anybody wants to talk about that in the question and answer, I'm happy to answer that. Too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed.